Welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast with your host, Emmett Muckles. Please visit iTunes, Stitcher, or EmmettMuckles.com to listen to all the episodes for free. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. I am your host, Emmett Muckles, and today is the day that you began. Let me say it again. Today is the day that you began. Yesterday is done. Tomorrow is not here. So start right now. Whatever it is that is positive, that will be fruitful in your life, start today. But I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm going to help you with your finances. I'm going to help you understand how to get in the area so you can start. And who is going to help me is my guest from West Virginia, Karen Ford. Hi, Karen. How are you? I'm great. How are you doing today, Emma? I'm doing well. So one plug I got to get in. Everybody, you can get the podcast on iTunes, TuneIn, TuneIn, uh, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, Spotify, all those places, and come to EmmettMuckles.com. Since we're plugging, Karen, how can people reach you? Oh, sure. Well, they can get my books on Amazon or they can go directly to my website, KarenFord.org. Is that, are you related to Tom Ford, the designer? No. <laughs> <laughs> Drats. That, that's exactly what I thought when I, when I saw your name. But you are a master financial coach. Let's talk about the journey. People don't just arrive somewhere. They don't just, you know, wake up one day. Well, actually they do. It's usually in a bad place. But what brought you to being a master financial coach? Well, I'm, my history is actually, my background is I'm a registered nurse, but I haven't practiced as a registered nurse for several years. And I was told when I was growing up, oh, Karen, you're good with money. You're really great. And I didn't even really pay attention to that. But several years ago, I had a friend of mine say, Karen, you need to get some training on financial coaching because you're really good with that. And yeah. I said, okay. So I went and I got my training and then it just, it just sparred from that, to be honest with you, Emmett. It just started growing. So I started coaching people one on one. I started speaking at financial seminars. I started speaking at churches and then I ended up writing a few books. So it has just enveloped. It's grown kind of like a volcano. <laughs> So erupting. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's how it is when you find your purpose in life, because this is one thing that's, that's really poignant that most people don't understand. Your calling may not be your occupation. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> and, and that's a left, a, a, a remnant of the industrial age. But what was your progression? So you just start talking to people, you start speaking at conventions and then there's some knowledge that you need to impart upon people, which is the foundation, which is what is the number one way to, for people to take control of their money? You know, I'm going to say this word and I don't want people to say, no, that's a four letter word. But the word is budget. <laughs> 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 that is honestly the number one way to take control of your finances, because simply put in it. A budget is telling your money what you want it to do instead of wondering where it went. Yeah. Now, I'll say that one more time. A budget is telling your money what you want it to do instead of wondering where you went it. You know, we just got done with tax time. And so many people get their W-2s and they are amazed at how much money they made this past year. And this is what I hear. I made all this money. Where I don't it? know what happened to all of it. <laughs> And you know what I say to that? If they're asking for my advice, obviously, I don't want to just throw out my advice because uh, advice not solicited is considered criticism. So if they're asking me, I don't know what happened to all that money. Do you have any insight, Karen? My next question to them is, do you budget? Because more times than not, if people say to me they don't know where their money went, it's because they don't do a budget. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be hard. Actually, a budget should only take about 10 minutes. 10 minutes a month is it. Because most people know how much their house payment is, what the car payment is. 
if they have credit cards, what those payments are, their food, et cetera. Most people know what those run each month. And it may vary a little bit each month, utilities, or if you have to buy a wedding gift or a baby shower gift or that kind of thing. Most people know what their monthly expenses are. And if you can do a budget, you can take control of your finances. Yeah, you know, that's funny because most businesses, they allocate bonuses, raises how they're going to do business business based on their budget. That's right. You know, that's exactly right. But they don't teach us this in school. This is one of the foundations. The things that we need to learn the most in school, they don't. (laughs) (laughs) They've done away with it. (laughs) They're dumbing it down. They're trying to make us uh, lean on them more so instead of using our own intelligence or wits. So, So with that, most people don't have a budget, but let's say our listeners are saying, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, for instance, I use Google Docs, Google Sheets, actually, to make my budget because it's everywhere. I can find find it on my phone, wherever. But, you know, we live in a debtor society. So most of the people are in some kind of debt. I mean, everybody has debt. If you own a home, you certainly have debt. If you have a car, you have debt. But then there's the other stuff that is just zapping you. So if they have this debt, how do they demolish that? How do they get rid of that debt in a in, in a systemic fashion? Well, that's a great question, Emmett. And simply put, what I ask people to do is write down all of your debts from smallest to largest. Maybe you have a few credit cards. Maybe you have a student loan. Whatever Whatever those payments are each month. And what we want to do is we want to start with the smallest and go to the largest. So each month you're going to make the minimum payments on each of those. But let's say the smallest debt you have is, say, a $100 credit card balance. And that payment is $50 a month. Well, once you pay off that credit card, now you have an extra $50 you can do something with. We don't want to spend it. Right. (laughs) What we're going to do is we're going to take that payment, that $50 payment that we no longer have, And we're going to apply it to the next payment. So let's say the other payment, the next uh, debt you have is, say, a $500 credit card. And that payment is $100 a month. Well, now that you got rid of that $50 a month payment credit card, obviously cancel that credit card so you don't get tempted to use it again. And apply that $50 payment with the $100 payment. So now you're going to pay $150 a month to that credit card. Once that's annihilated, now you're going to take the $150 and you're going to apply it to the next debt along with this regular payment. And that's what we call a debt snowball. You know, you start off small, but now you're building momentum and you're going to pay down those debts so much more quickly. Now I've asked, been asked this question, Emmett, well, wouldn't it make more sense to start with the highest interest rate credit card and get rid of those things? Not necessarily so, because let's say your high interest credit card has a balance of, say, $7,000 on it. It might make sense, you know, but the reality is people will not, they want to see a quick win. Yeah. So if they don't see it working right away, they're going to give up on it. That's why we say start with the smallest and go to the largest. Because once you pay off that smallest debt, now you've got a win under your belt and you're more likely to stick with the plan. Yeah. So we live in a credit-friendly society. We live in a plastic society. As a matter of fact, (laughs) this is a funny story. I went to pay for something or pay something off or something and I had like three grand in cash. And I handed it over and the lady looked at me like I was an alien. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. She looked at me like, you know, like she had that question. And I'm like, what do you do for a living? Right. And, you know, because I didn't simply swipe or have a debit card. But is it okay if you've had trouble in the past with credit cards? Is it okay to have a credit card? Well, you have to know yourself. And, and people are creatures of habit. In fact, when it comes to money, Honestly, and this is the truth of the matter, it's only 20% head knowledge, but it's 80% behavior. 
So if I can change my behavior, then I can change my financial picture. I can change my wealth status. I can change anything about money. But here's the key. I've coached people before where they've had credit cards uh, and they had all, well, before the, I met with them, they had gotten what they call a consolidation loan Ooh. and they consolidated all those payments together into one payment, which on the outside, it might make sense instead of having all of these payments add up to X amount of money each month. You have one smaller payment, but nine times out of 10, it doesn't work for most people because here's the thing. If you don't change your behavior, you're going to get right back in that rut. So here's, here's when I met with that couple. I met with this couple and they have a consolidation loan. And during this coaching, we discovered they have credit cards. That wasn't the real discovery. They both knew they had credit cards in both of their names. And then the wife says, well, I said, is there any more debts? She says, well, I actually have a few credit cards that he doesn't know about. Now they're married. Okay. So now she fesses up and then he says, well, I have some credit cards that she doesn't know about. When it was all said and done, they had 86 credit cards. How is that possible? 86. Well, that's what I, that's what a lot of people say. How is that possible? Here's the truth of the matter. Credit card companies, although they look at your income and they look at your credit history, they are more apt to give you a credit card and get you in that trap because they're going to make money off of you. Yeah, they will. They will make money off of you. So they had 86 credit cards. So here, okay, you, to answer your question, I went down a little bunny trail there. To answer your question, if you can have a credit card and pay it off every month, then I say, yeah, you can have a credit card. but if you can't pay it off every month, then you don't need a credit card. And you certainly don't, you should not get back in that trap. And here's the other thing. You may or may not really need a credit card because most people and most establishments, when you go online, when you rent a car, when you uh, book a flight, they'll take a debit card. Yeah. So why would you need a credit card? <laughs> yeah, you know, some places I travel a lot. I travel a great deal. Sure. And I try to use a debit card and they won't take it. But, okay. But I'm, I literally, if I, my credit card balance gets over a certain amount. Yeah. I, I am, emo I'm depressed. Okay. I yeah. literally do not feel emotionally <laughs> well. <laughs> I, I just had this happen because we were going through some changes and I use credit card and I have this balance. And I, was, I literally found the money. I sold what I had to sell. Yeah. I, I scrimped, I scra scraped, and I paid that baby off. And all of a sudden, this, like you see this background, the sun came out. Ah. <laughs> My blood <laughs> <Yeah>. pressure dropped. <laughs> I was a better yeah. person. <laughs> but, see, that's financially healthy. You're looking at it in a way where that's healthy when you're like, oh my gosh, I can't stand that balance being that high. That's good. Most of the time, people are just like, well, whatever, you know, and they'll just take out another credit card or whatever. So you're looking at it from a healthy standpoint. You know, you don't want that balance to get way up there because the longer it's up there, the more comfortable, the more comfortable you'll become. And that's actually not in a, that's not supposed to be where you're supposed to be feeling. You're not supposed to be feeling comfortable with debt. In fact, you, it, it is a proven fact that if you spend cash, you'll spend less than you would than if you use a credit card or a debit card. Th and Carnegie, true. that is, that's true. Carnegie Mellon did a study. This was years ago, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I'd have to look it up. But Carnegie Mellon did this study. And they simulated, they hooked up this person to an MRI, MRI machine, brain waves, right? They're studying the brain and they simulate this person spending cash and it activated the pain centers of the brain. <laughs> and they used this same person and they simulated this person using a credit or a debit card and it did not activate the pain, the pain centers of the brain. 
So that is actually very powerful. And if you think about it, if you go into a grocery store and you use a debit card, right? Yeah. You might mentally think the first, first few aisles, okay, this is how much I've spent. But by the time you get to that third or fourth aisle, you have no idea how much you've spent. Yeah. You don't know until you get to the register. But if you go in that grocery store with cash, you can pretty you come up pretty close knowing how much you spent yeah. by the time you get to that register. You know that's absolutely true because I remember uh, a time where we went to the grocery store with a calculator like clipped onto the cart. Yep. I'm like, nope, we can't get two of those. We can only get one. Yep. That's it. And then, and I remember a time when you couldn't use a credit or debit card in the growth for food. Right. And that, you know, but the lobbies work in mysterious <laughs> ways. <laughs> you know, it's such a, um, it, we're in a society and a culture right now where it's actually so acceptable with credit, debit. I mean, I get into a convenience store and, and let's just keep this, uh, let's just say this convenience costs. So many times people stop at a convenience store to pick up that little 16 ounce bottle of soda pop or, uh, you know, their donut, whatever it is they're buying. And so many times they're just swipe that debit card. I'm like, that's a dollar 94. You don't have a dollar 94 in your pocket. You actually have to use a debit card because we're mindless. You know, it's mindless to use a debit card. And then it's shocking when you go home and realize, Oh my gosh. I spent this amount of money today and I didn't even realize it. And that's the trick. That's the trick. That's the trap is you're, you're, you're not taking control of your money because we're so quick to swipe a debit card. And then we have that day of discovery when we look at our bank account online and realize, Hey, I spent this amount of money today using that debit card and I didn't even realize it. Yeah. I remember a time when. If you swiped and it was not an affiliation of your banking institution, you got charged a dollar to three dollars. Right. They yeah. don't even do that anymore because they know they're going to recoup the money on the back end. That's right. I was. That's so true. I remember getting it back back in the day when I had hair and was really <laughs> skinny. I had a thirty dollar charge on my bank account, and I was like, "What does this thirty dollars come from?" And it came from me ATM withdrawals from oh non-affiliated gosh. banks and charges that I had made. And I was like, I didn't make much money. So I was like, what is going on? And then I saw it disappear. And I was like, wait a minute. Banks don't give up money, so they must be making it somewhere else. Right. I, I want to pivot a little bit. Um, okay. Help me to understand, because you went from a a job, an occupation where everything was taken care of for you where taxes and insurances and and all the legal stuff was taken care of. How did you venture into where you are now um, navigating that field? Now, I, if I'm trying to understand the question. <laughs> How did you set up? Okay, let me make it simple because I can get a little okay. convoluted. How did you okay. set up your business? Oh, well, that was pretty easy. I went through the Secretary of State office. I set up the business. Obviously, it's not a whole lot of overhead uh, because it's either in my home or in a um, uh, in another place where I have an office. Yeah, and meet with the people and that kind of thing. And then, of course, utilizing a website so that people can find me easily. And of course, word of mouth is so very powerful. So, <clears throat> as far as taxes go and insurances and that kind of thing, having a good tax man. Having a good accountant is an absolute key. And of course, having all my ducks in a row, don't wait until the end of the year to tally up what your income is and how much you owe and that kind of a thing as far as taxes and insurance. Do that on the front end, either do it every month or do it every quarter. And that has to do with your own comfort level and you have to know yourself. Just don't put things off. And that that makes it so much easier if you just force yourself look, this is the month I need to do this. And of course, giving that paperwork, giving those numbers to the accountant so that they can stay on top of it instead of them having a day of discovery at the end of the year on your behalf. Yeah. Yeah. I found out that basically you have a partner as soon as you make a business and the partner is your business. You have to feed that business. So you actually have three entities 
that you are partnering with yourself, your company, yeah. and the government. That's so right. if you think about it from that standpoint, always think in 33%. So if you just kind of reasonably think 33% of what I make has to go to this invisible entity that is not attached to me, which is the government at a very minimum. (laughs) Right. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) You have to prepare. Yeah. Yeah. I got a shock my first year. I was like, I owe how much? (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, then the benefits from that were... There were a lot of things because I had a home office that I could use differently, <laughs> so to yeah. speak. But attach, but she's exactly right. Find yourself a good accountant. If you have a lawyer friend who does accounting as well, you're in a gold mine. Yes. So that was pretty awesome. And, and that's what it's about because we're in this new economy and people really need to understand this, which is getting back to the basics of what America is about, which is small business and entrepreneurship. Now, you are not only dealing with debt, you're a real estate mogul as well. <laughs> yes, oh, got to love that real estate. So, yeah. You know, and one of the things about America, which was originally part of our, you know, our verbiage was life, liberty, and the pursuit of land. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. think about it. Think about those early land rushes and how much people were focused in on land. If you look at movies, you know, particularly of the 1800s, 1700s, it was about land. Uh-huh. And, you know, we're kind of missing that ball. So help me understand what you enjoy about real estate investing, because I told you my story. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy real estate investing because we flip. We buy properties and then we sell properties. Um, we, we may or may not flip all of them. Uh, but we purchase properties through auctions, uh, through foreclosures. You know, there's a wide array of ways to purchase real estate. So, and we do them all. But one particular place that we thoroughly enjoy is through the state auditor office. And every state has a state auditor office. And what happens is if people don't pay their personal property taxes on their homes, their real estate, uh, then what happens is it ends up at the state auditor office. Mm -hmm. And they hold an auction every year in every county in that particular state. And so we check those properties online once we know the date of the auction we do our due diligence. I learned that the hard way. I'll tell you about the trailer story if you'd like. <laughs> but uh, we we discover and see where those properties are, and then we drive by them and see what kind of condition they're in. Now, I, I do want to say this. Not every person that loses their property to the state auditor office are bad people. They may have died. They may have not had any family members to leave it to, and that's how it ends up. So it's not always the case where this person purposefully didn't pay their taxes. They may have passed away and didn't have any heirs. So we discover where those properties are. We look at them. And if they're in good t- condition, then, then when that auction comes up, we start bidding. And the properties that we win, so to speak, we pay for, and then we have to do, go through a process with an attorney to make sure we have a clear title deed. And that can take anywhere from two months to six months. And then once we get the deed, Then we go in the properties and evaluate the condition. We may or may not do any repairs. Uh, We empty those properties of anything that's been left in them. And then we either decide we're going to flip them or we're just going to sell them and make a profit without us doing anything to them. Yeah. So so do you have a company that do you, do you have a company or work with someone that does the actual work inside or is it um, hands on for you? Is it sweat equity? We started off in the beginning with sweat equity, and now we actually have a company, a person uh, who has workers for him that we hire and uh, we tell him what we want. There's a, 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 a contract between the two of us mm-hmm. and how much we're going to pay him to do it. And then he does it. And we have a timeline. He'll tell us this is how long it's going to take. And then once he's done, then we put it on the market or we flip it ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask you about if you, once you purchase these properties, what if there's a lien on it? What happens then? 
If there's a lien on it, uh, then we won't get a clear title deed. Uh, the person who has a lien, and that can either be a bank or that can be an individual because maybe there was some kind of a contract between the, the owner and them. So it's up to uh, the state auditor office. You know, we have to do a, a notice to redeem, meaning all the heirs, if there were any, or if there were any liens, that's the attorney's job to see if there were any liens. And he puts it out there. So they have an opportunity to redeem it. More times than not, they're not redeemed. But the people, if they have a lien against it, they have an opportunity to redeem it. And if not, we end up with it. That actually, that's a good question because we actually had a house uh, that we recently just got. I mean, literally, we just got the deed a week ago. This house is a three-bedroom home, kitchen, living room, full basement. I mean, this house is in is on a dead end street. It's in really good condition. Has a lot of furniture and clothes that were left in it. A minor roof repair that needed to be done, and of course, mowing and weed eating on the outside. We paid, I think, two thousand for it. So what? all in all, yeah, two thousand at the auction. All in all, with the attorney fees and everything, we have twenty five hundred in it. And so, yeah. So we're going to have our our handyman remove all of the things that were left in the house, do the minor roof repair, mow and weed eat, that kind of thing. And so he's going to be done in a week, and we're going to market it at thirty five nine. Now the reason we're going to market it at thirty five nine is because we don't want to deal with a bank. Meaning, if we put it on the market for say eighty, which we could, yeah. Now you're talking about someone needing a bank loan and then you have to go through the rigmarole you know rigmarole yeah. of an appraiser inspection and all that what we do is we'll market it at 359 obviously cash is king so we'll make a deal if somebody wants to buy it for cash otherwise we're going to set it up for 4000 down monthly payments and that and then we're the bank so financed yeah. by lender i mean financed Correct. by owner yeah and that, you know, that gives us money each month and we have a deed of trust that's set up when we close, meaning if they stop making those monthly payments, we'll foreclose on them and we'll take the house back. Right. So, and we set up the payments where it's an automatic payment from their account to our account on the first of each month. That way, because we've done rentals before. Oh, yeah. And if we had to chase them down, then that, you may as well have it as a rental property. Yeah. So we have a deed of trust set up so that we can take it back if we need to. We've never had to do that. But I think the, the reason we've never had to take a property back is for that reason, the deed of trust and the automatic payment. But well, yeah. That's a good system. That's a really Thank good you. system. Because, <laughs> you, you know, what's really funny is we only think about real estate in one of two modes, which is, you know, buy a I have three modes, buy to stay, buy to mm -hmm. flip, like really sell it and get rid of it. Like, give me all the money. I'm done with it. Hand wash or rental property. And you've come up with a great strategy for, you know, anyone in different geographical area. Cause I know you don't want competition, but there is enough for everybody. <laughs> you no, know, there is surely there is in, in uh, the County in which I live every year, they put online the dates of the auction. And in this particular county, uh, there's always 26 pages of property. Wow. Yeah. And of course, that happens in every county in this state. I don't know. I mean, the amount of properties might vary, obviously, depending on uh, if people let them go, you know. Yeah. Uh, it might be a few more pages or less pages, but there's always there's always pages of properties to, to be had. And I'll tell on myself, the reason I said... Do your due diligence. Just don't bid just to bid. I learned that the hard way several years ago <laughs> when I first started. What was that scenario? That scenario was I, I get excited about holding the number up and I thought, Oh man, I got to get a piece of this pie here, you know? And so this property came up. I knew the general vicinity of it, but I didn't go investigate. I didn't go and look at it before the auction. Dun, dun, dun. And they start the auction at $10 per property. So I bid $10. Nobody bid against me. And I was like, oh, good. I got this property. Yay. Well, long story short, you do the attorney thing. And I got the deed. 
And once I got the deed, I went and looked and saw where it was. And it was an old abandoned trailer. <laughs> and there was a padlock on it. And it had a sign, uh, do not enter. This was a meth house. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, okay, I can't do anything with this trailer, but it, this trailer is on this lot. So I put it on yard sale sites on Facebook, and I was blatantly honest. This is the property. Here's the tax map. It was a meth house. It's uninhabitable. The trailer has to be removed, but you will have a nice lot for your own trailer. Yeah. I sold it for $1,400. You're, you're like, get rid of this thing. I got rid of it. I, I sold it cheap, and they knew they couldn't live in it. Because obviously, if it, anything that was a drug house or anything like that, you, I mean, you don't want it. Yeah. So, you know, you know, get rid of it. It's it's really uh, bizarre because, you know, depending on where you are, the numbers will change. For instance, so I'm I'm in between two kind of opposing states. I'm, I'm near Chicago, okay, but I live in Indiana. And if I cross the border, the numbers jump astronomically. Right. So, you know. What can people prepare themselves for if they're looking in this market? What if they're what what strategies do they have if if they're new, they're working a program like yours to be, you know, financially stable and they want to get into this. Okay. What's a low level inroad for this? A low level inroad would be to check out the state auditor auction. Contact your state auditor office in your state. And ex explain the scenario. I know you have an auction every year to sell properties that the state has taken back because of non-payment of taxes. When is that auction? And then start asking questions. And if they post it online, that's even a greater benefit. And ask them the properties. Check into it and find out what the bids start at. And just start small. If you don't have a large cash stream right now, Start small. Don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars at the auction, you know, if you don't have it. Start small. Buy a few properties. Obviously, go and check and see where those properties are uh, before, you know, you bid on them. Yeah. Do your due diligence. See if there's any roof damage. Are the windows intact? More than likely, if the windows are intact and there's no roof damage, then it's probably dry on the inside. Yeah. So, you know, you can consider that. And then once you win, do the due diligence, jump through the hoops, do everything you're supposed to do, and they'll run you through what you have to do because you'll want to get an attorney to make sure that you're going to end up with a clear deed when it's all said and done. But you said an important thing there, uh, Emmett. It, depending on where you're located, you know, you can buy a trailer in West Virginia you know, anywhere from 3000 to 20000 depending on what you want. You put that same trailer in Malibu, you know, you're <laughs> going to spend $750,000 for it because true. of the location. So look at the location of where you're deciding to bid on the properties. You may live somewhere, you know, and in your particular town, this property may be valued at, say, $30,000 when it's all said and done, when you're ready to sell it. But if it's in a town next door to you, like you were talking about, it may be at $80,000 you could sell it for. Yeah. It may only be $10,000. But the point of the matter is you want to make money. So don't bid on a property that, you know, you get excited and you spend $5,000 for this property and it's horrible and you're just wanting to break even when you sell it. Look at the location, make sure that it's in good condition, not a lot of water damage or anything like that, because mm -hmm. it's going to take longer to sell if that's the case. So the auditor is just trying to get the tax money that is owed, typically, correct? Correct. And they're not in the real estate business. They don't want to maintain these properties. Yeah. They don't want to hold on to these properties. They just want to get the properties off their books to another owner because they're What's gonna pay the state taxes. auditor going to do with it, right? right? So, yeah. And it's because of the taxes. Now, sometimes properties can be redeemed if there are heirs or, you know, the owner actually is alive, <laughs> but maybe they don't live in the state and 
they forgot to pay the taxes, whatever the case may be, there is a possibility that the property will be redeemed. We've only had maybe one property redeemed, but most of the time they're not. So what happens in that in that scenario? And I, I wanted to ask you that is, okay. so let's say you purchase a property. There's an actual lien on it of like $10,000. You purchased it for $2,000. Okay. What happens with your money if that person says, and, and if you say, well, this is, this is a bad deal. I'm not going to make any money on it. What happens then? Okay, let's say that I bought a property and the through the attorney, it's discovered there's a lien, right? Well, he's going to let the state auditor office know. Of course, there's there's paperwork involved with that. Mm-hmm. I don't want to make it sound so simple on my part. Right. But the attorney is going to send all that information to the state auditor office and there will be a, a, notice, a, a notice to redeem letter, certified letter, or a notice of publication in the newspaper, et cetera, to all of the entities, whether they're heirs or maybe the lien holder. Okay. And they'll have an opportunity to redeem it. So let's say they do redeem it and I bid $2,000 on that property. The state, they redeem it. I get my two thousand dollars back that's what from I was, the state auditor. That's yeah. what I was wanting to find out. Yeah, and I'll get. Uh, I will also get the attorney fees back because the lien holder will have to reimburse the state auditor for back taxes that weren't paid. Yeah. Right. Plus, they're going to have to pay the state auditor the two thousand that I had bid on it. Right. The lien holder is going to have to reimburse the state auditor office that money. And sometimes they can Money cancel each other. I have tied into it, yeah. And sometimes they can just cancel each other out, and the lien holder will be like, "Ah, oh, go ahead, knock that out." Forget it, <laughs> right? And that's what happened with this house that we recently got. I don't know. I knew there was a lien against it. I don't know how much that lien was. It was actually a bank, and they just thought, oh, "Forget it," and that's how we ended up with the deed. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because they can write it off. They can write it off their books right. um, yeah. from the government. And yeah. banks don't want the property, especially if they don't think they're going to make their recoup their money. Yeah. You know, so so what three things? Let me digress. Okay. So you're sitting on your couch. You're enjoying Game of Thrones or something. All right. <laughs> Probably got a uh, glass of Moscato or coffee or whatever you like to have to relax. And your doorbell rings. And you get up and you go to the door. And you open it up and there's this beautiful 21-year-old Karen looking at you. And she says, I only have about one minute. What do you have for me to get to where you are now a little easier? Are you talking about being financially free or are you talking about life in general? Life in general. Okay. One minute. All right. Budget. Get out of debt using the debt snowball and start making money. Have a cash stream, passive income. It doesn't have to be real estate. Do you have a hobby that you enjoy doing? Don't do something that you're not going to enjoy. Do you have a hobby that you enjoy doing that you could potentially make money at? I talked with a person one time that knitted and I said, you know, you can make money by doing that. You're in the middle of winter right now. So she started making hats, messy bun hats with the hole in it, you know, for yeah. the bun to come through, gloves, scarves. She made an additional $700 a month during the winter months by selling those things. My wife did so, too. <laughs> yeah. Whatever passive income you can do. And if you want to get into real estate, do your due diligence study, call the state auditor office, start getting your feet wet. Don't jump into the deep end of the pool until you've waded in uh, the, the shallow end of the pool and start with that. And then as you start making money with it, then maybe start buying homes for at foreclosure or other type of auction, you know, that kind of a thing. That's what I would say. Budget, demolish debt, get out of debt, build wealth, use passive income and utilize real estate. Awesome. I want to thank you so much for being on the Billionaire Lifestyle Podcast. Thank you so much, Emmett. My pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, you know how this ends. When you get out of the shower, 
Wipe the fog off the mirror. Drop your towel. Bask in the glory of how you came to this planet. That is the essence, the bare essence of you. That is your God body. Now, I want you to get close to the mirror and I want you to look into the eyes staring back at you because everything is fractal. Your eyes look like nebulae in the sky. As above, so below. What you think it, your body produces. As above, so below. You are a powerful, powerful entity. You are made from the creator, the alpha, and the omega. That is in you. There is a plan for your life. But you are getting in the way. You're not running your program. You're running someone else's program. Media. Society. Run your program. Every day when you get out the shower, look at that body. Look at the moles. Look at the lack of hair. The excess of hair. That's you. It is made in the image it was supposed to be made. It is the perfect you. And... Love that entity that you are witnessing. And when you see one that is similar, that is outside of your nebulae, love it and treat it justly. Till next time, love you all. Be just. Peace.